All right. So when we extend the rationals by the primitive fifth root of unity zeta five, our instinct is to say that the polynomial, the simplest polynomial we can think of whose root is zeta five is t to the fifth minus one. That's the most obvious choice. But t to the fifth minus one can't be the minimal polynomial because while zeta five is a root and it's monic polynomial, it's not an irreducible polynomial because it has a rational root. What is its rational root? One. One is always an nth root of one, right? It's always one, the number one is always going to satisfy t to the n minus one is equal to zero. Um, so if we know one is a root, that means that t to the fifth minus one has to factor. Has to factor how? What factor do we know must be a part of t to the fifth minus one, given that we know that one is a root? t minus one. T minus one. So we know we can factor a t minus one out of t to the fifth minus one. And then what's left over here, maybe that's our minimal polynomial. If we can demonstrate that it's irreducible, then that answer is yes. So where I'd like for you all to pick up is to find that quotient and then see if you can convince yourself whether, it, whether or not it's irreducible. If you can, then that'll sort of unlock the rest of what's going on in this question. What did you get for the quotient? What is the other factor when we factor t minus 1 out of t to the fifth minus 1? t to the fourth plus t cubed plus t squared plus t plus 1. Oof. All right. So that's the quotient. By the way, how do you get a quotient like that? What was your process? I used synthetic division. Synthetic division. Oh, all right. I like synthetic division. So we could have just done 1 up here, and then t to the 5th, t to the 4th, t to the 3rd, t squared, t constant. And then dividing. The constant was negative 1. Oh, sorry, you're right. The constant is negative 1. Yeah, that would have been sad if I screwed that up. OK, uh, and then in synthetic division, what do you do? Bring down the leading 1. Bring down the leading 1. Multiply and then add. Multiply 1 times 1 gives you a 1 and then add those two together. Then 1 times 1 carries over to here, add those together. That 1 times 1 carries over to there, add those together. That 1 times 1 carries over to here, add those together. That 1 times 1 carries over to here, add those together. Oh, done. And what does that 0 at the end tell us? The value of the function Aha. The value of, uh, of the original polynomial? Yeah, yeah. So this is p of 1. And the fact that it's 0, this is also our remainder when we divide. And because the remainder was 0, that means that this does go evenly. And the quotient is t to the fourth plus t cubed plus t squared plus t plus 1. OK. Now, back to the question of irreducibility. What have you done so far to investigate that question? All right, so Eisenstein can help us, but only after making a substitution. Shifting this polynomial from t to t plus 1. When you shift it from t to t plus 1, what do you get? t to the fourth plus 5t cubed. t to the fourth plus 5t cubed. Plus 10t squared. Plus 10t squared. Plus 10t plus 10t plus 5. And... What do you know about that polynomial? Irreducible over Q, Irreducible over Q because Eisenstein with, prime five. Eisenstein with prime five. All right. So we're going to spend a considerable amount of time, probably in our next class, focusing on these polynomials specifically returning to that Pascal's triangle stuff that we were doing a while back. Um, what we'd like to know is when is the minimal polynomial of one of these roots of unity, the simple thing that we have written here, t to the fourth plus t cubed, you know, when is it something that looks just like that? In particular, when is that irreducible? And last time we said that that's irreducible as long as what? What condition did we need in order to get irreducibility for this red polynomial? 
it's prime. yeah, it's degree plus one is prime. So that's a start for us. Um, that anytime we're extending by a prime root of unity, then one plus t plus t squared all the way up to t to the p minus one is going to be a minimal polynomial. But it's not always the case. In fact, it's not the case when n plus 1 is not prime. But now we have the minimal polynomial for this example. I'm going to write a little bigger here. So what other column can I fill in right away based on this minimal polynomial? Yeah, what's the degree of this extension? The degree of our extension is 4. What are the other roots of this minimal polynomial? Um, does i work? If I plug an i into this, i to the fourth is equal to 1. i cubed is minus i. i squared is negative 1. Plus i plus 1. Yeah, close, but no cigar. This adds up to 1, not 0. Yeah, so I'm actually going to leave this for, for you to explore for a couple of minutes. Um, see if you can figure out what are the other roots of this polynomial. And my hint to you is remember that this polynomial was a factor in t to the fifth minus 1. In fact, it was the cofactor to t minus 1. And so the other roots of this irreducible polynomial will be the other non-rational roots of t to the fifth minus 1. It's a lot easier to think of its roots than it is to think of the roots of our 1 plus t plus t squared and so on. Right, because 1 has so many different names in the polar form of a complex number, we can solve the equation t to the fifth is equal to e to the 4 pi i instead of t to the fifth is equal to e to the 2 pi i to actually discover a different, cube, uh, sorry, a different fifth root of the number 1, e to the 4 pi i over 5. So let's get that written down. What are the rest? e to the 6 pi i. e to the 6 pi i over 5. e to the 8 pi i over 5. And just to make your point again, e to the 10 pi i over 5, and e to the 12 pi i over 5, and so on and so on and so on. But what is e to the 10 pi i over 5? It's e to the 2 pi i. And what's e to the 2 pi i? It's 1. So in other words, this isn't an other root of this fourth degree polynomial. In fact, we don't want this in here. Oops. Eraser's too big. So that goes away. What about e to the 12 pi i over 5? What is that? It's e to the 10 pi i over 5 times 2 pi i. Ah, yes, yes. This is the same as e to the 10 pi i over 5. In other words, e to the 2 pi i times e to the 2 pi i over 5. Right, because 2 plus 2 fifths is going to give me 12 fifths. Um, OK, and e to the 2 pi i is equal to 1. So we need to write that. And e to the 2 pi i over 5 is what we called zeta 5. So if we're looking for the other roots of this polynomial, we don't need this in our box either. Now my question is, do we know that these three purple numbers that we've convinced ourselves are the other roots of this fourth degree polynomial that make a total suite of four, which is what we know we need by the fundamental theorem of algebra, must these roots belong to this extended field? How do we know that these roots belong to our extended field? 
a field has closure under multiplication. So what can we multiply together from if within our field to get, say, e to the 4 pi i over 5? Zeta 3 times? Zeta 5. Oh, sorry, zeta 5. Zeta 5 times? Zeta itself. Zeta 5 squared, which must belong to this field because fields have closure under multiplication, and zeta 5 is in our field by definition. So that root's got to be in there. What about e to the 6 pi i over 5? Zeta 5 cubed. Therefore, it belongs. e to the 8 pi over 5. Zeta 5 to the 4th. Therefore, it belongs. So is this a normal extension of the rationals? Yes. Yes. It's a degree 4 normal extension, because we can't have zeta 5, whose minimal polynomial is 1 plus t plus t squared plus t2 plus t to the fourth, unless we also have the other three roots of that polynomial, because the other three roots of that polynomial happen to be powers of zeta 5. That's the other thing that makes this unique, that we have this rather simple description of the other roots of this polynomial in, in terms of the first one that makes it more or less obvious why this must be a normal extension.